coming. My name is Marius. I'm here on behalf of Thompson MUX. Yes. So we are a community of volunteers, designers, and researchers, but out of discipline they're working too. We've been around for almost 10 years, and for that I have to thank Tatiana for nurturing the community. Um, a bit about you. I have a big question. Wondering who here is at the first Amsterdam UX event? Okay. So, half. Right. Who's here not a designer and not a researcher? A minority. And who works with AI on a weekly basis? Well, two things about me. So, I joined the new in 2015. And it really helped me transition from engineering to product design. Uh, after that, I did industrial design at TU Eindhoven, just as Koos has done. And I've been working with small or medium sized enterprises with pitch to transformation for the past years. Um, we have a new format, Gram to UX, which is learning to design with AI. That's where you're all here. The goal of being lead up is to investigate how AI can be a partner in the creative process and also how we can build AI into the offerings we create, making them more personalized, better with time, without extra design interventions. We also, some of us may be worried about the, how the economy is going to be impacted, or, this, or the society, or the job market, and I think as a designer, we have those responsibilities. Be mindful of those things as well. Um, so for today, for the schedule, we have a talk, which is about 30 minutes. Please note your questions. Uh, we will have time for them later. And then I'm really excited to work with the guys at Argo who have prepared some interactive demos. Great. So, Goos, thank you for hosting us and for all your energy. Take it away. Cool. Um. <clears throat> So, sorry, we're not wireless tonight, so I'm going to be dancing around this a little bit. Um, yeah, so my name is Chris. I'm a principal designer here at Argo Design. We are a seven-year-old agency now, I think. Uh, we're a strategic design consultancy, um, and we help companies out with uh, everything to do about design. But that uh, is, and by the way, we're in Amsterdam, Munich, Austin, as well as New York. So we have studios a little bit more global than only in Amsterdam. Um, what we help out with is anything from the beginning of innovation, so research. If you don't even know what you want to do as a company, but you know that your competitors are already ahead of you, how can we help you out? Uh, we do strategy as well, so longer term thinking beyond like what are you going to do next. Of course, we do the design part, so that's anything from concepts all the way to detail design. And we have technologists as well, which means we can help you make it for real. Um, and we work for all kinds of clients, big ones and small ones. Um, and I have some examples here. Um, it's basically, tonight is about AI. This is the first in a series of talks on the topic of AI. And I was going to explain, like, why are we talking here? What's, what do we have to say about this? Because it's taking the world by storm all of a sudden. What, what's this new thing? Um, it's not really new. We've been working with this for quite some time, but it has changed recently. Um, and that's kind of where this talk comes in because now everybody has access to these tools rather than just the people that work in machine learning. Everybody can start these things up in their browser and play with it. Um, so this is one project that we did and I'm gonna be a bit unspecific because we work for these companies, but the IP is not ours. You know, as many design consultancies, we, uh, we work in secret, we work in the dark and behind the scenes. Um, but this is, for instance, a tool that we did a few years ago that actually helps um, people that don't work in machine learning to design machine learning workflows. So it's a node-based UI that allows you to involve several machine learning models, connect them together, and make tools for decision-making or all of the tools that you basically see online that use AI. So um, think of the scary scenario of uh, you're a credit card agency and you want to rate people um, basically on if they can get a credit card right away. Tools like this are in the back end to help people uh, make these flow. It can not only come from the researchers. And so this is a really um, interesting way of, of thinking about AI and building it. Um, but of course, not everything's for the scientists and for the people who are programmers. So we also work with a company called uh, Builder.ai. 
that actually allows people to um, go online and spec out an application that they want developed. So right now, if you are a person that wants an app and you go to a person or to a company to get your app developed, it, it takes months to just spec it out, describe it, get the designs in and whatnot. Um, Builder.ai is making this all easier and allows you to online in the browser, um, spec out your app and get it developed by this company. So check them out. It's uh, super interesting what they're doing. Uh, another company that we worked for here is a tool called Blaze. And it helps you make machine learning models for little chips. So not all machine learning happens online. Not everything's an API, not everything lives in the cloud. Sometimes you also have a little chip that needs to take decisions. Think of uh, a little alarm sensor here in the building. It might have to go off where there's fire, but what defines fire? And a machine learning model can figure out like these types of vibrations, these types of sounds and these gases, that type of stuff is also a machine learning model. Because you can't just codify that as if the temperature needs to be at this and it, it just needs to be a bit more complicated and machine learning can help, so help us take those decisions. So this is a tool that we've developed that uh, allows people to actually train these up without having to all do that from a terminal window because lots of machine learning happens in terminal windows, in Python scripts, and it just happens in the area where only developers and, and scientists have access. But as designers, we make UIs, we make difficult things easy to use. So these are some, some of the projects that we've been involved in over the past few years that kind of put us in a cool spot for thinking about how to use AI when, when we're designing as well. So we're, we're kind of thinking about why is AI blowing up now? And I alluded to it beforehand. Um, it's kind of three things came together pretty recently. And so what has happened? Computing is now generative. We can basically use computers to make things but only by describing them vaguely. And that's because the computer can now assemble things into blocks that we know or blocks that we want. That could be text, could be images, could be sounds. AIs can make music if you want. If it's good music, that's, that's there to be said. That's, that's up to everybody's own opinion, but we're, we're getting to that point. And for instance, you see a couple of tools here and the pink green one is open AI with uh, chat GPT. Most probably everybody has played with it or at least heard from it. Um, there's mid journey up there, which generates images, which is definitely something that all of us designers are addicted to. Uh, we do also have Bing search that recently, uh, released their chatbot for searching. So rather than searching on the internet, you're searching in a big machine learning model database that then involves the internet. Uh, and so generative computing allows you to give a vague input and get big, smart answers back. But let's rewind a little bit to kind of see like, why is this now so big and so different than before? So originally computers were created to perform repetitive tasks. And so this is one of the older computers. And as many innovations, this happened during wartime, the computer you see here was made for actually making uh, ballistic missile uh, calculations for firing solutions. It's super scary, but this was a machine where uh, there was actually a team of uh, five programmers here, five female programmers who were the first ones that really uh, know how to do it. They made, uh, they made this machine work, but they needed to speak the machine's language, right? As you can see, this is nothing that we can do. It doesn't have body language, can't speak to it. You're just plugging things in and out and then you get the answers. Of course, to use that, we needed to speak the machine's language. And this is, this is 20, uh, 30, 40 years later, that's an HP desktop computer. It's the first thing that we call the desktop computer. Had a one-line display, LCD, looks like your alarm clock. <clears throat> you had to put tapes in, it had a keyboard. If you take a good look at that keyboard, it looks unrecognizable because it isn't even like the one that we're using right now. You know, that's, that's one of the first computers, but we still needed to speak the machine's language. You needed to learn a programming language. Of course, over time, we were like, well, that doesn't work. We need to make that simpler. How can we talk to this computer better? And this is Windows 3.11. That's the first time where really like icons and mass uh, interactions became available for everybody a little bit before this you had MS-DOS, but this is the first time where it was like, oh, I can now see what the machine can do because it has icons that tells me what it does and it has menus that shows me what the options are. And so it's more discoverable, it's more easy to use, but still, this is not how I see things in my head and this is not how I interact with people. So we're still learning the machine's language even through a mouse and a keyboard. So of course, at some point we were done with that. We were always aiming at how can we make this thing speak our language. Now, that's Google Home, 
I think we all know that it speaks human, but not really. It takes very specific commands, and you need to say it in the right order. It's going to misunderstand you a lot, and basically it speaks back in a, a voice that sounds human, but it doesn't feel quite human. So in the background, companies like Google and OpenAI and everybody have been researching how can we increase that, increase that. And because computers have gotten faster and faster and faster, basically sort of a perfect storm happened in the past two years where these machine learning models, so these databases that these things use got so big that it accidentally started to understand our world. So we put so much information in this database and that statistical database that knows like, if you ask it a question like this, this is probably the answer, or maybe this is the answer. It's like, a, it's called a neural network, but it has, it has all these uh, statistical decisions in it on the whole world. And so these large language models know how to speak our language. Many languages, ChatGPT speaks Dutch if you're asking to. You don't even need to click something, you just need to tell it like, and it just switches, right? And Midjourney knows what things look like, and that's thanks to a database called Clip. Um, there's just this kind of size switch that happened, as well as uh, OpenAI releasing these things into the uh, public domain by making it open source. Um, and that's what happened. This stuff got open source, and then all of a sudden, everybody on GitHub could get these things and code with them and improve them and started playing with them. And then a company like OpenAI also decided to just make it publicly available in the browser. And so now we all have phones in our pocket that can run these things. Whereas before this was only for people who had a really, really big computer and know how to speak computer, right? So that's kind of what happened recently. And um, it started to blow up sort of last summer. Like image generation uh, came up a little bit online and uh, um, GBT3 came out and they put that in the browser and then they made it into what they now call chat GBT. I was like, okay, Everybody's using it. Everybody's talking about it. Microsoft is releasing it. So it's here now. But um, to sum up, basically, we went from a device that just can do things at a great speed, calculations. We taught into speaker language, but now accidentally, not accidentally, very intentionally, it now understands our world. And that's basically what we're using. That's where generative computing comes from. So at Argo, we always try to do this, right? We, we try to sort of stay ahead of this curve. Um, we, we need to be ahead because you can't help people with innovation if you're still trying to figure out what things are. Now, that being said, I think the whole world is trying to figure out what AI is, even the people that have created it. We don't quite know what it can do yet, and we definitely don't know its societal impact. So for us, what that means is that we need to think by making. That's one of the big mantras here at Argo. We just... We play with things and we, we make them, uh, in, in this case, AI, um, to figure out what it does, what it's for, what does it do well, what does it not do well. And so um, in this case, we, we were like, okay, not everybody's using it, so how can we, how can we make that work? And um, one of our colleagues started a, a, a contest, basically, this black does not exist, a contest for the ages. We did a movie poster competition here at a company for movies that don't exist. And the uh, only premise was like, make it with AI tools, go ahead. Uh, we didn't even get the specs for the resolution of the poster. And uh, that, was, that was a whole mess, but you've seen them around here in the studio as well. It was quite a successful competition and really, really beautiful and fun things came out. Um, but of course, this is not client work. This is just us playing, trying to learn the material. What does it do? And me as a designer, when I'm in Photoshop or something else, I, I can do these things normally. But now when working in AI, can I, can I do it in the same way? Does it meet those quality standards? Can I do the things that I want to do? So let's run through one of the posters. This is one I made together with Antonio, who's also here tonight, if you want to chat to him. He's over there in the back. He's, uh, he's the master behind the story um, of the movie that we're talking about here. So. In this case, we started out with ChatGPT and we, we knew we wanted to make a movie about an astronaut because, you know, sci-fi, it needs to be cool, it needs to look cool, but we had no real idea for the rest. So we basically told ChatGPT, like, write a synopsis for a movie about an astronaut that has to perform mundane tasks on a space station. We were like, how can we sort of juxtapose this being an astronaut with just doing weird things? Okay, well, if you read the description on the right, it was like, meh. We, we weren't basically challenging ChatGPT enough by coming up with something crazy. So we added a little bit like doing the laundry and mopping. 
just imagining an astronaut doing these really boring things being out in space. And the description started to get a little bit more fun. And this description is much longer, but it's not necessary for us to, uh, to look at that today. We were like, okay, how can we push this further? How can we make this into an idea that we can start designing with? Because we need to know what this movie is, even though it doesn't exist. So we're like, give me five possible titles. We need a good, catchy title. And actually, Antonio and I figured out that there wasn't a good, catchy title in here. We're like, okay, you know what? We're going to override that, but then use it to make the machine do what we want. So we said, the title of the movie is Spin Cycle, which is a pun on like spin and gravity in a space station as well as washing machines needing to do their spit cycle. Uh, we just wanted to make it about something simple. Give me five quotes by media publishers. It turns out it's really good at that. When you get more specific, when you really ask it to do these kind of weird creative tasks that are sometimes hard to come up with, sometimes easy, it gets very specific. And so we continued with that and we were like, okay, let's go visual. So we used a tool called Mid Journey. Uh, I'm not sure who here is familiar with it, but it's definitely worth a play um, later, you can also try it on our computers if you want. We have some interactive stations, but Midjourney is basically the same as ChatGPT. You can put it in the description, but it makes images. And um, one thing about um, machine learning is that it progressively gets better as we use it and we tell it what are good answers and what are bad answers. And Midjourney is a company that really smartly built that right into their workflow. So whenever you tell it to make an image, it always gives you four options and you have to pick which one you like most or two or three. And so they gathered all that data and this machine is getting better and better and better. It's super interesting to think about that, which is why we got hundreds of cool images of astronauts that look like sort of passable. But as a designer, of course, you look in more detail. Um, to do this, to make these images, you put in what's called the prompt, same for chat GBT. Um, and I, I put a black box here as a joke and ask me later what's under the black box. But initially when people started using mid journey, they did not want to publish their prompts because it's like the act of creativity and the act of copying somebody's work becomes really, really easy with AI by just copy pasting a sentence. And so people started to figure out ways to protect their work, or at least to just not say what the magic words are that make it look so cool. Cause I have to say all these images on the right are like pretty neat to me. But if you want to know what's under the black box, we can talk about that later. Um, but then I had a couple of images and I was like, it's, it's okay, but I need more variants of it. So I used a different tool called Automatic 1111, which is uh, a different way of generating images in something called Stable Diffusion. It's basically two different companies doing the same thing. Um, and then you can actually get hundreds of variants of the same image. And as you see, they're all kind of similarly posed in similar color spectrums, but still all of them have different bits, pieces that change. And it's really interesting as a designer to be able to actually grab an asset and get variants of it. So rather than having this one photo that you got from an image database that you have to work with, you can actually get thousands of photos that are slightly different where you can pick the pieces that you like. Now we did pick the image in the middle and it kind of ended up looking like a colleague who's here. You guys can all later guess who it looks like. But um, in the movie, ChatGBT told us that it was with uh, Bill Murray as an actor. And this doesn't look like Bill Murray. And also there's like a, a big American flag on the shoulder. And I was like, oh, that needs to be a laundry badge because he's on laundry duty. He's not like a proud astronaut. So what can you do then? And then these AI tools actually allow you to take tiny pieces and tell it what to do to those pieces. So here I basically went through an iteration to make sure that it looks like Bill Murray. And as you see, it slowly sort of starts to understand what I need, or I start to tell the machine better what I want. So now you all of a sudden have an astronaut Bill Murray there, which in Photoshop could take you a lot of time, but here it took me uh, 15 minutes and just a little bit of typing until I had Bill Murray in that helmet. So I went over to the patch on the shoulder. And again, in Photoshop, if you want to change this patch into something that looks like it's under the correct lighting, it's possible but it's tough. And in these tools is actually really not that tough. So I got something like 40, 45 different batches and I just flipped through them until I got the one I liked. I was like, you know what? These other two batches are also not nice. I just want to change them. I want it to look a bit more like a washing machine. And there you go. This has all been done without Photoshop. And now I have an image where I'm like, the original image was cool, but it had some defects. And I flipped those out. And this is, this is mind blowing. But then at the same time, now thinking, okay, I have my base image, but how do I make that into a poster? 
those things actually don't work in AI. AI has a lot of trouble with text. It doesn't understand text at the moment. I'm sure they're working on it. But today, if I need to make a poster, I can't use uh, generative tools for this. So you start to treat it like an asset that you got, like a photograph. So making a layout in Illustrator, then upscaling the image. This is, this is another superpower of AI. It basically, because it understands visual things, you can resize things much bigger than you could before. Um, and basically in Photoshop, when you resize something, it starts to look at the pixels mathematically and then scales it up. And so you get either blurry edges or details that don't matter or it sharpens them. But then uh, when you use this uh, latent upscaler, it actually understands the concept. So you can zoom in really far and it starts making it up. It knows that this is a fabric, so it could keep on zooming in. And as long as it keeps on understanding it, it would turn into like a microscope piece of fabric if it's correct. That's, that's open to imagination, but, um, yeah, but again, this, this looks very painted. This is not a photograph. So I actually opened it up in Lightroom and treated it like a photograph and then made it look more cinematic. I added film grade, I added vignetting and I'm like, okay, let's now treat like I got a photo, but I need to make it feel more like a movie. Um, then we went back in, put all the layers on top, but of course, visibility is not quite there. So you add your visibility layers, you a little bit of shadowing. And then it's like not quite interesting yet. So I pushed the text through the helmet, did some kind of glassy effect on it. And I could tell you that 80% um, of the time for this poster was actually spent hand making things in Photoshop and Illustrator. That's still where the, where the biggest effort is. Now, of course, if I would have been doing these patches and, and build Moray manually, it might've been even longer. So it was definitely a time saver, but it's not something that's gonna replace our workflow anytime soon because I need this to be like client quality work and not something that I just generated quickly where it doesn't quite uh, work. Now, something funny, if you look at the image, if you look at his left leg, actually not attached to his body, if you really trace it, <laughs> it's also stuck in the washing machine. The poster's up on the wall if you wanna, wanna look later, but it's really funny to think that. It makes images that sort of pass your initial test of, oh, that looks good. But then actually, when you look at them, they really don't look good. And all the details here are actually a little bit off and a little bit wrong. So that's very interesting about this AI artwork is that you just need to start to look better to see if it's AI. And yes, there are images where you can't see it, but this one in particular is very good at hiding it, but not quite. Um, there's more posters up on the walls. Some of the artists are here as well today. Um, so if you want to talk about how they did it, um, there's there's many stories um, on, on how they did it and, uh, and how much effort it cost and what kind of weird things happened on the way. Um, so I wanted to take it back to like, what does it mean for designers? Now we've been playing with AI. I've been seeing these UIs that I've been using and we started to talk off a little with like, what is it to design for AI, not with AI? You know, everybody can use ChatGPT in mid-journey, but actually ChatGPT in mid-journey are horrible experiences in my mind. They're really not made by UX designers. It's, it's really not something that's actually really helping me. It's just an interface on top of a programming uh, API. So let's take a quick look at some of the things uh, um, that we've been thinking about or have been discussing here at the company. First one is uh, explore responsibly. So I bet many people were expecting me to start with this topic because AI is kind of in a weird spot right now. Uh, it tends to be wrong a lot. Actually, Google lost a lot of money because their AI made sort of like a, a tiny mistake that's really almost forgivable, but they lost about 100 million, I think, in stock on, the, on one day because their demo showed an AI giving a wrong answer. Intellectual property is completely unclear. Um, it turns out that there's um, somebody who made a comic book and started selling that online through Kickstarter. Um, and he is, uh, they, they lost copyright on that comic book because the, the American Court of Law said, well, this has been made by AI, that's not a human, and we only copyright human-made things. And it was a very black answer, it was very simple, but for that person, that ga that's game over, anybody can now start selling his comic book. And that's kind of like, well, there was a lot of effort in that, there was a story that he wrote, all the images he put together, but they were like, no, because the base came from an AI, we don't care about it. So it's just something that you need to keep in mind that currently intellectual property is unclear. And so we tend to not use it in client work for now. It might end up in techware like this as a background as something that's not part of the deliverable, but you have to watch out when they're putting it somewhere deeper. And the last one, of course, is that 
to make these machine learning models, you need a lot of input data. And that data has come from the internet. And most of that data came without permission of people to use that data. So um, in this case, uh, for Mint Journey as well as Stable Diffusion, there's a, a really large group of people that have set on ArtStation, which is a website where lots of digital painters go. Um, those digital painters go there because if they want to be a digital painter and basically be somebody in the world and, and sell your work and have a portfolio, you need to put your stuff there. But then they got stolen basically by these companies or at least used by these companies to make these models that can mimic their style. So that's one of these considerations that you have to keep in mind. There are other companies working on this. Adobe launched a product two days ago. My talk is already old. They launched a product two days ago that has more ethical stuff, or at least uh, it's only opt-in uh, artwork that they've used for their, uh, their model. But uh, let's put the boring stuff aside and let's uh, start to look at what's actually out there. So after, with great technologies come great new design challenges, because now if you have AI, if that's a capability of your app, you can do things like help people create things that's completely new, or at least the way it works right now. You know, people find things, answer complicated questions, even reasoning questions. You could personalize experiences. An app could start up and be completely personalized to you almost without intervention. And so that means you almost don't have to design the app anymore, but it can design itself on the fly per person. Or it can even communicate with people. So your app can now talk, it can speak, it, it can even generate a voice and, and have a personality if you want to. Those things were out of reach before, or you needed like a very specific uh, group of developers or a spe very special team, but you can now actually start designing with this and know that it can be created. Um, so we have some things that we found on our way by using these interfaces and thinking about them where we're like, okay, there's, there's, there's some UX gaps with tools that are out now that you can play with and that you can use that we would love to sort of work on in the future. So. It's not putting us out of a job as designers, it's actually creating a new job because there's a whole set of new problems that need to be solved so we can harness this power properly. Um, one is designing for discoverability. People don't know what's possible. Like when you have ChatGPT in front of you, it's an empty box and it's like, uh, tell me something, make me do something great for you. And you have no idea what to put in. And there's actually really complicated things that you can let it do, but you don't know. And so when you go out there, you actually have like people who are showing what this tool can do who do not work for the company that made ChatGPT. And these lists are plenty. And so it can make SVGs for you. That's vector graphics. You can tell it to make an SVG of a logo and it, it knows how to write that code for you. I didn't know it until I saw it here. And so you see that the discoverability currently is really, really poor and people are all sharing this. It's, it's full on Twitter. Like I used this prompt and it did this and everybody is telling each other what it can do. So. Midjourney is actually based on discovery. So Midjourney is that image generation app. That's a very popular website attached to it because everybody who's making images in Midjourney, or at least everybody who's not paying a lot of money for it, all of your images are published in this like infinite feed and you can see what people did. So if you see the little red box there, if you want to make the image of the spider in the background, that's the prompt that was used and you can literally click a button to copy it. So you see that Midjourney has got this down a little bit more but it's not quite really helping me in learning about this. It's only helping me copying other people. Um, and then you see, for instance, the companies like Google who are now integrating these tools into their tool set. They're like, no, people are not going to write prompts. That's not the way forward. We don't want to say everything out loud or type everything to our computer. We need buttons. We need to actually wrap it up again in functions that people understand. So this is going to be your, your future Google uh, email interface where you can actually just type a bunch of things in there and then tell it to formalize your language for to elaborate, basically make it longer. So if you're ever out of inspiration, Google has a button to just add bullshit to make it longer help them and, and make people feel like you put a lot of time in. Um, there's a button for that now, but that's that's... As, as bad as it sounds, that's UX design. That's where you're thinking about, okay, so what do people actually do with this? What do they want to do? And how would you make sure that they understand that it's possible? Because hey, AI can do a lot more than we know right now. Next one, um, help people navigate the maze of possibility. Um, I really like how this came out. When iterations are free, it'll become difficult for people to manage and curate. I had a lot of images when I was working on the poster and I, I just couldn't see the forest for the trees anymore. I was like, how many shoulder patches do I have now? And how many Bill Murray faces that look sort of okay, but how do I rate them? What do I do with them? How do I just 
sort of go through this data set that before I would just spend time on one image and make it better and better and better. Now I have to wade through all of these options. So what's happening? This is, for instance, ChatGPT going off the rails. Uh, but I don't know what questions I asked it anymore. And it's just working forwards. And it's acting like every question I ask is the ultimate question that I need an answer to. But just imagine trying to write a piece of text and helping, in, uh, helping you improve it. This long scroll interface is not helping you with anything, unless you always agree with the last answer and you continue going forward. But as we know in design, some, sometimes you like to branch off and you like to try another option and you like to hold three, uh, three truths in, in mind and see which of the options do I want when I work them out. This is not helping. On my journey, you can rate your images, look at how tiny they make the emoticons that help you figure out which one you liked and which one you did. It's really hard to sort them by it or filter them by it. Like mid journey is also like, if I look at mine, I have, I think 4,000 images in there now, and it's impossible for me to find one back from, from a month ago. Why? But then when we look at other tools like Lightroom, and I'm sure a photographer is uh, familiar with it. It actually has a whole tool set where it allows you to compare before and afters, put all of these things, give the ratings, uh, flag them for yes or not used, tag them. Like we know these interfaces inside out. Why aren't they being built by these AI people? So this is one of the, the next challenges. If you use generative AI, how do you help people to actually wade through the amount of content and make these things? Next one, um, foster skepticism. Um, AI tends to be wrong a lot. It will be wrong a lot, but uh, people tend to want to believe the machine. You put something in, in chat GPT, you ask it for an answer, and you're like, I want to believe that this is true. And you ask it, how do I run this design project? What are the five steps that I need to do for this? Why would you want to ask a machine that and not really deeply think about it? So for instance, this is one. Um, my son is now four months old, and I, I think about his future a lot. And so I was like, okay, what's the absolute best way to design a backing application for kids? And thing number two there, as much as I know it'll be successful, I do not want to gamify money in my son's head. I don't want him to need badges for good financial behavior. That's just a bad idea all over. Yes, it'll make it a sticky app for kids, but I asked it literally, what's the absolute best way to design this? And it just gives me a straight up answer and it doesn't tell me where it got it from, why it's thinking this, it just tells me, this is what you need to do. That's scary to me. And the more we use it in this way, the, the weirder applications will get. Um, but of course, there is also like a light on the horizon. Uh, this is perplexity. You know, also see the Bing search, but it's like when you're searching something and you get an answer, it helps you with the sources and you can flip through those sources and actually see what were they saying about the original question that I asked it. It's really good to actually like lift up the, the veil a little bit and you figuring out, I asked it a question, but where did the answer come from? How was it constructed? And so this is one of the ways, but this is a very heavy, heavy handed way because now I need to, I, I get my answer to my question, but I still need to do the research. So it's not quite the final solution yet. I don't know where it's going to go. And then there's this other thing that I haven't seen in, uh, in UIs yet. Um, when an AI generates that, and uh, this, for instance, actually, it's uh, the model that can translate audio files into text and basically automatically make you subtitles from an audio file. Um, but it has this uh, value called the confidence factor where it basically this, this person gave a, a color to word on how confident is the AI on the word that it understood. And did it really understand it or might it have been something different? And I'm not sure if people have been using transcription tools here, but they tend to say weird things, weird words appear in sentences. You're like, that makes really no sense. But have you ever seen the confidence rating under that? Or do they allow you to flip that word out? Why not? I think it's really important for us to think about that confidence factor. Like how do we show people that the machine actually isn't that sure? Because it's going to come across hella confidence. It's fast. It gives you a single answer. Why wouldn't you trust it? So this is, I think, an interesting experiment and a first step for that. Um, think it through. I already hit on it a little bit with the play responsibly slide, but uh, think about legal and ethical implications of AI in your designs. There is a reason why we're not selling designs yet with a lot of AI work in it, because they're just, there are too many cases. This is the comic book uh, um, case that recently happened. Then actually, um, 
as a follow-up on that, this is an article from, I think, uh, last week. Um, now you can keep the copyright on AI uh, work, but you have to state that it was generated by AI. And then to see if it's copyrightable, we have to prove how much work we did versus how much the machine did. You just see that the law is trying to catch up with this. And this is all American law. I can tell you that Europe is going to think very different about this because on topics like this, Europe is always a little bit more hardline. Um, so we don't know where it's going. And so if we sign a contract with our client where we say all of the work we deliver that you pay for is yours, we, that's actually untrue if we don't watch out. So you have to really think about where am I using it? How am I selling it? And do I actually need to put a clause in my contract before I tell people this is all yours and you can, you can publish it? And next up bias um data sets are hugely biased um they are biased because of where the data came from they're biased by how much of representation is in that data set and they're biased by the people that are doing the rating of that content and so uh, i really encourage you to go to missjourney.ai it's a tedx talk i think it was here in amsterdam or will be here in amsterdam but this is a, a glaring fact about midjourney right now if you tell it visualize a dentist, visualize a doctor, visualize an artist, whenever it tends to be dudes all over. No particular other reason than that the data set is biased. Um, of course they can fix it, but that doesn't, that, that just means they fixed the most glaring mistake, but what other biases are in there that you can't detect. So always keep that in mind. Um, IBM has really good uh, visualizations on how they test for biases in data sets if you wanna look it up later. Um, and then this, this is my favorite one. Um, so if you later want to talk to me with a tinfoil hat on, um, most of the things that we're using right now are based on something made by OpenAI that's either ChatGPT or any of their auto, other models. They all run in the cloud. And so all of our data, everything that you're typing in is going to one single company's database. This privacy policy is very weird, but it basically says anything you upload, we can keep and we can read that. And this is changing daily because of course they know we're looking, but they don't really care that much. And so uh, my premise is, or my, my, my worry is, who says that OpenAI right now can't say, what projects is Argo working on? Because you know, we use it here at Argo. Like we've written a little bit of text for a client because we didn't quite know how to do it. Somebody else used it for an email. And we already know that OpenAI can like parse large amounts of data and then get the right answer out. So who says that they can't do that with all the stuff that we're putting in it? I wrote a poem for my nephew for, for Christmas. They might be able to figure out what my nephew's name is and that he's into hot sauce, you know? We're, we're all, you know, we, we had these worries about Facebook, but I think this is much worse because we're putting much more direct data in here with context because then the machine gives a better answer. So think about these things. When you're building this in for your customers, when you're building this into your own workflow, should you or should you not? Um, we can talk about this later. It's not what the presentation is about. Um, and then, of course, conversational design. Machines can now speak back to us, but do you want it to speak back in its tone? Do you want it to just be your customer service and then trust in the fact that OpenAI gives it a nice tone of voice and that it knows your side? Um, the, one of the next up talks is going to be by Alice Boter um, on April 26th. So um, she's going to be at CGI, right? Um, so you can register for that at uh, the next meetup. So in summary, what we found, what we think are the next problems that we as UX designers are gonna be solving, designing for discoverability because people don't know how your stuff works, help people navigate because generative AI creates lots and lots of things but doesn't help you pick, foster skepticism uh, because is the machine right? Is it not right? Where did it get it from? Why? And just think about the fact that is this really the best way of solving your problem? Um, but keep in mind, AI is not going to take our jobs because we are the experts on design. Everybody has seen these things online, like, hey, can AI now do UI design? Well, yeah, it looks like UI design, but anybody who will code this screen will be like, what does this button do? Why is it there? Does it work? W what's it even for? So yeah, it makes things that pass the test of like five milliseconds and you're like, oh, that looked like an app. But it's not designing your apps for you yet. And even when it does, even when it codes in React and it makes buttons that work and it talks to an API, that's still not the best user experience because all of that is based on an old data set and we move forward, not backward. Next one, my favorite. We're the experts on humanity. Um, 
AI has had a lot of trouble with eyes, with teeth, with fingers, number of fingers mostly. They're fixing these problems, but we are the experts on what is human and what is good for us. So keep that in mind, like AI is not taking your humanity from you yet. Um, and think by making them play, just, just come and play and figure out what these things can do for you.